going? Hello, hello. This is West from the Great Climate Race coming at you live uh, in Toronto. Uh, it's 3 o'clock Eastern Time in Toronto, just a little bit after 12 noon Pacific Time. Uh, and I've got a really fun, interesting show for you here today. Uh, I'm just, first of all, welcome again to uh, the Great Climate Race Live. This is our second episode of the Great Climate Race Live show. We're going to be doing this every week, uh, Fridays at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time. That's 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, we are in the midst of a cross-Canada road trip, uh, which currently has taken us to the, the lovely uh, area of North York, uh, hanging out with family here for a little bit. Um, and we're going to be doing this show everywhere we go along the trip. I'm just trying to add a graphic to the screen while I'm talking to you. Uh, so give me one second. But this week on the show, um, we're going to have some really awesome stuff. Uh, we are going to... Boom. Look at that. Bam. Look at that. All right. Cool. It's working. Um, Great Climate Race Live. Here we are. This week, we are going to uh, talk about... Exciting stuff uh, in the world of electric vehicles. I'm going to get an update about uh, the Great Climate Race uh, Tour. I'm going to show you an interview we did with uh, none other than Mark Tizia from Novo Solar. Uh, big high five to Mark. Uh, thanks for doing that interview. Hi also to you guys on Instagram. Uh, if you're watching on Instagram, you're only going to see uh, me. You're not going to see all the stuff that I'm sharing on the screen over at Facebook. So if you want to see the Facebook Live version, uh, go check it out. Although I'm sure it'll be fascinating anyway listening to it here uh cool uh and i'll end it all off with a question of the week so y'all ready sound good okay uh and the beautiful thing about being live is at any point you can post your comments your questions and i will do my best to respond to you in real time sounds like fun i hope so all right let's give it a go um okay but you know what but first first before i do you're gonna have to humor me for one second here folks because i really want to try to get this logo on the screen every week i promise i'll get a little bit better at uh using this software um so just talk amongst yourselves while i'm doing this <laughs> no just kidding uh new tech new image overlay you can't see what i'm doing but i can which is i'm looking for the great climate race logo so i can put it on the screen while i'm talking um so you probably know that this has been a big week um, for the world of electric vehicles. Today is the day, actually, that Tesla's new car is uh, running off the uh, assembly line tracks for the first time. Serial number one of uh, the Tesla Model 3, their new consumer-focused automobile. Um, this week we're going to talk a bit about uh, that car in particular, what's going on with Tesla, uh, but also we're going to get into some misconceptions about electric vehicles as well as some other news about electric vehicles. Um, that's all going to happen momentarily. Uh, but first, I am going to spend a moment of your time trying to make this work. Whoops. Did I do it? I did it. Hooray. All right. How's it up there? You like it? All right. Cool. All right. So back to this screen here. Um, so, first things first, uh, Mari made me promise that I would remind you this week that uh, you can follow our tour live on our email list, uh, follow our tour across Canada, greatclimaterace.org slash tour dash updates. Uh, you'll find a landing page that looks like this. Big thank you to Katarina, uh, who made the landing page for all you guys on Instagram. I'm going to pick up the phone and show you what's going on over there. Can you see that? Yeah, it's kind of awkward here. I'm going to put this back. All right. You guys are just going to have to put up with watching me talk. All right. So um, that is uh, my little my little plug, my little shout out. Uh, if you want to follow our tour, you can do so. I'll tell you more about what's going on on the tour in a moment. But uh, the point is we're doing interviews with people along the way, doing profiles of all kinds of cool projects. We'll tell you about what we're up to. And you can uh, watch us as we're going for runs and walks uh, to raise money for solar. In fact, we just went for a run right before I, uh, I sat down in front of you. I just uh, got out of the shower, sat down. Hey, Kevin Millsap, how you doing, buddy? You're in the middle of biking all over the place. I've been watching you uh, as you go, saying hi to Kevin over there on Instagram. Okay, so uh, in terms of exciting stuff, uh, if you saw the New York Times this week, you may have seen that Volvo made a big announcement, uh, which is that they are phasing out conventional engines. The uh, Volvo uh, Motor Company, which is now Chinese-owned, uh, they got bought by Ford, didn't they? Uh, you know, formerly... Uh, what were they, a German car? 
of uh, Swedish engineering. Um, you know, I uh, I have a personal connection to this because the first car I ever drove was a Volvo. Uh, my dad uh, had a one of those really boxy Volvos when I was young uh, because they were very safe. The station wagon, um, you know, and then had a lease agreement. So kind of every four or five years, whatever it was, he'd get a new one. Um, but it's interesting that they're kind of leading the way of the big auto manufacturers in phasing out uh, their cars. You'll have to excuse me while I drink out of this fossil fuel thing here. I'm a little bit famished from that run we just came back from. Please excuse the uh, recyclable bottle here. All right, so uh, that was big news. Uh, 2019, they're going to phase out everything except for their electric vehicles and their hybrids. Very cool, right? Um, I actually think it's kind of an interesting week that they chose to make that announcement. Um, they weren't the only one to make announcements about electric vehicles this week. Uh, actually, if you're paying attention, you may have seen that uh, uh, this week the hippie-approved Volkswagen electric microbus is soon to hit the road. Uh, also uh, an interesting announcement. I'm not sure how you feel about that or whether it really is hippie-approved, but uh, you know, nice to see kind of a range of different electric vehicles becoming available. Uh, by the way, you'll notice that all the slides I'm showing you, these are screen captures from posts on the Great Climate Race website. Uh, this one I shared directly from Climate Parents, very cool group uh, in British Columbia. Uh, and actually, if you look at the timestamp on it, I shared it on my birthday, July 2nd, which was last week. Uh, we did our first broadcast, um, you know, just recently. I'm going to move this Instagram over here. Let's see, is that a little bit less awkward? Yeah, I think that's a little better, right? What do you think? If you guys are watching it, you got to tell me what you think. Um, so the, uh, the new micro bus, uh, is, uh, is, is kind of goofy looking if you ask me, but kind of cool. Um, but you know, it, uh, again, happened on a week. Hey, thanks. You like it better, Kevin? Cool. Uh, the, uh, uh, the same week that this was happening, the first Tesla Model 3 rolling off the assembly line today, uh, and, you know, we actually heard earlier this week that that was happening, so I don't know if it was a coincidence that Volvo made that announcement and Volkswagen made that announcement, but uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, you know, this huge moment in uh, the world of electric vehicles is happening at the same time that we're hearing these other announcements from these other auto manufacturers. Uh, so, interesting, anyway. Coincidence, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, a lot is going on in the world of EVs. Uh, in fact, if you um, were paying attention to... Uh, um, the Great Climate Race Facebook, you'll see that the CBC did a piece today about how all these auto manufacturers are making electric vehicles. Uh, and it's an electric arms race, says Kevin Milsip. Kevin, you get all the uh, all the quotes directly from the screen because I'm seeing them pop up on Instagram. Um, also because you're biking all over the place, so that's cool. Um, so, yeah, Model 3 rolling off the assembly line today. I love it because, um, you know, this is a huge moment. For anybody who hasn't been following Tesla since day one like I have, um, you know, they started out with a very expensive, small little Roadster. It was like over $100,000. Then they had their uh, Model S, um, which was their, you know, slightly more affordable, like seventy, eighty, ninety thousand uh, dollar $90,000 car. Uh, it's more like a coupe. Um, and the idea is that they're basically rolling out their cars the way that uh, people roll out products in Silicon Valley. Start with, uh, you know, a small limited release of a real high-end version um, that's expensive, but the early adopters get it. It's sexy. People want it. There's FOMO. Um, they've successfully done that to the extent where by the time they rolled out the Model S and the Model X, which was a very cool um, you know, SUV equivalent, basically, in terms of the number of passengers. Uh, how many people does that thing hold? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight passengers. Uh, seven, eight? You tell me. Anybody out there got a Model X? Um, anyway, I mean, the equivalent to, a, to an SUV. Three, roll, three rows of seats inside of that thing with the big gullwing doors. Um, you know, and uh, now the Model 3... Uh, their newest vehicle was the biggest launch of any product probably ever. Uh, I think in the first week they sold 350,000 of these with $1,000 pre-orders, the uh, biggest crowdfunding campaign ever. Uh, you know, they raised billions of dollars. I think that number got well over 400,000 within, uh, you know, a couple of weeks. I'm not even sure what the number of pre-orders is now, but, I mean, the waiting list is, like, years. Like, if you order one today, you're lucky if you get one in 2018. I'm not even sure if you will. Uh, and for the record, it is uh, July 7th uh, of 2017 right now. So uh, they're expecting that the first of these uh, cars, I think the first 30 or so of them, are going to show up uh, at people's doorsteps around the 28th of July, which is actually a little ahead of schedule. That's July 28th of 2017. Uh, big moment. So I thought I'd take this opportunity as we're talking about electric vehicles uh, to 
well, I'll say one more thing, actually, about uh, what's going on with Tesla, uh, which is they've started to sell in China. It would not be a story about uh, electric vehicles. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my friend J.M. Toriel. Uh, J.M. Uh, is one of the people who I know who's been the most driven and obsessed with electric vehicles for many, many years. We've been talking about electric vehicles for, gosh, got to be 10, maybe even going on 15 years. Um, and he's, uh, you know, part of a number of different organizations, but, uh, I would urge you to check out the Vancouver Electric Vehicle Association, Viva. Uh, they had a booth set up at the Great Climate Race the last couple of years. We also had a, a Tesla on site for people to check out. Um, just spent some time recently on Salt Spring Island. Uh, I gotta say, shout out to anybody on Salt Spring Island watching this. Um, the, uh, place with the most electric vehicles per capita anywhere, uh, in North America. Um, but, you know, I think this is just the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, you know, Salt Spring Island, it's cool because they've got these charging stations set up all over the place. And, and I find that particularly interesting. Um, but, yeah, so we're going to dive in a little bit to, um, you know, uh, some misconceptions about EVs, some important things to understand about EVs. This is going to be basically the format every week. I'm going to sort of talk about some news stories. Then we're going to look under the hood so as to speak of these news stories a bit, give you a little bit more understanding, a little bit more uh, uh, to think about in terms of... Uh, you know, kind of what's going on in these areas, and hopefully it'll generate some conversation. Uh, then we'll do, again, we'll do a little update, uh, and I'll try to do at least one interview profile. I'm going to try to keep this week a little bit shorter than last week, although I've already been rambling on for a while. We're going to try to keep the show around 30 minutes. Last week we went about 40, 45 minutes. Um, I think 30 minutes is a good length of time, but we'll take as much time as we need. Sound good? Cool? Ready to go? Yes. All right. Cool. So, um... You know, for many years when people talked about electric vehicles, something like this was basically what came to mind, right? Like this nifty-looking sports car. All right, for you Instagrammers, I'll turn this around and show it to you. Can you see that? Oh, man, that's hard to do. All right, yeah, <laughs> so that's the uh, that's the idea of what a uh, an EV looked like in the minds of many people. And I, and I think this is basically the problem that we've got in the world of uh, the discussion around climate solutions is we think that the solutions are like somewhere way out there in the future, something that we're going to have to wait for for generations to come, for decades to come, that, you know, it's a nice idea, but maybe, you know, someday we'll get there. And we hear that echoed in the kind of comments from politicians, even, uh, you know, some folks who uh, who care about climate change, like uh, like the Prime Minister of Canada, who... You know, for whatever you think of the guy, I, I do believe that he cares about climate change. He spent a fair amount of political capital trying to get a carbon tax through. That's a whole other conversation. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Uh, but the point is, you know, he said that, you know, we need the pipelines to pay for the uh, uh, for the wind turbines. You know, that someday when we have the technology, we'll make the transition. Uh, but right now it, it's in development. Uh, you know, it's just this kind of nifty idea of something in the future. Reality is, is that um, that actually electric vehicles have been around for a long time. Uh, what you're looking at there is actually uh, a picture from General Motors. In fact, some of the very first cars that were ever produced used uh, electricity to, to drive them and, and had very old uh, crank engine uh, motors with basically very simple batteries. Um, you know, so the, the idea of an electric car is not a new thing. Uh, what really has been the big game changer is the battery technology, how we actually uh, make it possible to, uh, you know, to, to have the range to get from point A to point B. And that's uh, always been the big question is, is this issue of range. Um, you know, there's a very common misconception, uh, and we'll get back to the range thing in a second, but there's a very common misconception. Um, this is one of those kind of myths that you see uh, all over the place, which is that, uh, that electric vehicles aren't as green as you might think. And this is a uh, uh, a screenshot of an article from Wired magazine, which uh, I, I think was actually relatively irresponsible of them because they were basically repeating stuff that was industry talking points from folks who are, uh, you know, basically trying to spread misconceptions about EVs. Uh, I'm not sure exactly who in industry or, or where this idea came from, but there's think tanks and others out there who are trying to slow the adoption of renewable energy technology, trying to slow the adoption uh, of, um, you know, electric vehicles. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's been some very good work done to respond to this idea, uh, I think most notably by the Union of Concerned Scientists who did this report, uh, which is basically a life cycle assessment, or LCA, um, that compares electric vehicles to um, traditional gasoline cars and looks at all the greenhouse gas emissions related to the manufacturing, uh, to the use of the vehicle, you know, basically the entire life cycle. So, uh, you know, that is um, basically the, the gist of the argument that was made in Wired Magazine is that, you know, there's so much energy needed to produce the lithium-ion batteries, to produce these cars, 
um, that they actually created uh, the same or even more greenhouse gases than gasoline cars, which is just incorrect. Uh, it is probably true to say that the actual manufacturing of the car uh, is more greenhouse gas intensive. That may change as we produce more of them, get better at it, do it in a larger scale. Um, and of course, the uh, uh, Tesla Gigafactory, that massive uh, battery facility, is going to be a big game changer. Um, but you know, the Union of Concerned Scientists, uh, which is a coalition or a, 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 a group of scientists from all over the United States, uh, you know, uh, all kinds of very reputable people. Uh, you know, I urge you to Google this, find it for yourself. We'll also post it in the show notes uh, on our blog, as well as right in the comments on Facebook below this post or on YouTube below this post. By the way, you can find this in all those places because uh, we're repurposing all this video for all those reasons. Um, they they dove into this issue. So I'll give you a little taste. Um, you know, so for one thing, they actually looked at, um, you know, the, really the question here is where is the energy coming from? Uh, that you're putting into the car. Uh, and of course, if your energy is coming from coal, if your electricity is coming from coal, um, you're still actually producing less greenhouse gases um, than a gasoline powered car. But, you know, it's different than, say, if your majority of your energy is coming from hydro, like is the case uh, in British Columbia, the majority of our electricity coming from hydro in, in British Columbia. Um, so the map you're looking at here is the Union of Concerned Scientists just looked at a comparison of, uh, you know, how much. Uh, you know, the, the electric vehicle would produce in terms of uh, uh, greenhouse gases in different regions depending on where their energy comes from. Um, here's the, uh, uh, the graph that really tells the full story, which is comparing um, a full-size or mid-size EV to a gasoline car uh, and looking at the greenhouse gas comparison for the full life cycle. And what you see is a 51 to a 53 percent reduction. And of course, that gray area there, the reason why it's a question about the, the total percentage is it depends on where your energy is coming from. Are you getting electricity from coal that's then driving your electric vehicle? Or are you getting it from gasoline? Uh, you know, and, and the interesting thing is, even if you're getting your electricity from coal-fired power, because electric vehicles are so much more efficient, because they don't lose energy uh, from heat loss, um, you know, they're just much more efficient automobiles. And the result is uh, that you actually have a cleaner driving car in terms of greenhouse gases, even if you're getting your electricity from coal. Um, and of course, those are two separate things we need to deal with. We need to be reducing the amount of energy we're getting from uh, sources like coal. We also need to be reducing the amount of uh, electricity uh, or we need to be shifting from gasoline automobiles. In fact, in British Columbia, uh, where I live, the number one source of emissions is from automobiles. And the second is from buildings. Um, electricity production is, is actually further down the list because we get the majority of our electricity from hydro because we're blessed with hydropower in BC. Uh, and as we travel across Canada, we're actually going to look at the electricity mix and the renewable energy potential of different provinces. Uh, we'll do one in Ontario probably next week. Um, and uh, from there, we'll talk about Eastern Canada, we'll talk about Quebec, uh, we'll talk about uh, all the different places we're going to stop across Canada. So uh, stay tuned for more information about that. And again, if you're interested in following our tour, um, you can get updates along the way uh, if you sign up at greatclimaterace.org slash tour dash updates. <laughs> I'll post the links to that in all the various places. Uh, wherever you're watching it, look down there and you'll find uh, the link for where you can get updates. Um, except for you on Instagram. Maybe I'll post it in the comments. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, this, this really comes down to the issue of, like, where does our energy come from? Uh, and it's important to remember that more than half of global energy is coming from burning coal. Uh, that is really the big thing that we need to change. Uh, coal is the most greenhouse gas intensive uh, way to produce energy. And unfortunately, it's what half of the planet is still doing. Um, so, you know, there's some that argue uh, that we actually shouldn't be switching to electric vehicles because it'll produce even more demand for electric, uh, for electricity, uh, therefore even more coal production. Um, I, the reality is we need to do both. And in fact, we're, the reason why we started the Great Climate Race is because what we're experiencing right now is a race against time. We are in a race against time uh, to make a transition. Some say it's too late already. Uh, but the reality is that we really need to get started. And there's a lot of real win-wins. In fact, um, you know, manufacturing... Uh, you know, automobiles in the United States is a great way to create jobs in the United States, right? If you're worried about uh, the U.S. economy, uh, then why wouldn't you be supporting technology that's actually, uh, you know, really doing best in the United States? Tesla is the leader 
Uh, and you know, Ford said they never would have built their electric car if it wasn't for them. Even the even Toyota uh, says that Tesla pushed them to go faster and further on their uh, hybrid technology. Um, you know, so I, I think we need to be thinking about the win wins as kind of the first things that we do, and and. EVs are an obvious way to go, especially as the price of the batteries is dropping substantially. Um, you know, I could have done this entire talk on like, are uh, Tesla cars better, or you know, electric vehicles, just generally speaking, better than gasoline cars? Just by showing you this slide, which if you're watching on Instagram, is actually just a picture of a kid sitting inside of the trunk on the front of a, 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 a Tesla Model S, uh, where the motor would be on a traditional engine. Um, there's a, a cartoonist that I love uh, who did a, a cartoon about what it was like owning a Tesla. Uh, and what he said was that, um, you know, the best thing is that there isn't a giant exploding engine uh, about, you know, uh, what is it, about a few, a few, about a foot away from your crotch. Excuse me for being a little bit uh, rude, but that's, that's the reality, right? Like, uh, uh, gasoline cars are really, really dangerous. Uh, they actually had to change the safety ratings for uh, Tesla uh, so that they could even really fully account for how safe this automobile is, not just because of its, uh, you know, frame and its ability to withstand, a, a, you know, an impact, but there isn't a giant exploding pile of gasoline uh, sitting right in your in your midst, right? So, uh, I, I think that is one of the critical things to understand that's different about uh, about these cars um, is that they're just very efficient, they're much safer, and uh, they're better in terms of greenhouse gases by a long shot. Don't believe the, the people telling you otherwise. Um, I think it's also really important, though, that we remember that, uh, you know, we're not just going to shop our way to sustainability. Like, it just if you and I all go and buy Tesla Model 3s and let's say that... Uh, you know, the economy in India and China gets to the point where every consumer can afford their own private automobile, um, you know, we are ultimately aren't going to solve the problem. Like, this really ultimately is a design question. Um, so I'm giving you another little uh, piece of homework or an interesting little extra piece to, to dig into if you're curious about this sort of thing, which is um, uh, Seven Rules for Sustainable Communities, Design Strategies for a Post-Carbon World, which is a book by Professor Patrick Condon from UBC. Um, I love this book. I know he's done a series of other books since then, um, but this really does a great job of looking at just some basic design principles for building our cities in a way that's sustainable. And, you know, if we all are dependent on cars, we're going to just gobble up more and more of our farmland. Uh, you know, we're going to build a car-dependent sprawl uh, that, you know, really just is fundamentally unsustainable. Um, and the reality is that much of what actually needs to be done is about urban design, urban planning. Uh, to use the BC example, about a million people are expected to move to the Lower Mainland in the next 10 years. Um, if all of those people drive cars and uh, and all those people depend on cars for transportation, what we're going to see is a kind of development that's just fundamentally unsustainable. Whereas if we invested instead in, uh, um, or not invested even, but, uh, but actually just planned around uh, uh, public transit and instead of building more and more highways and more and more sprawling communities, um, you know, about a third of the housing stock that people are expected to live in has not yet been built. So the question is, where will it be built? Uh, if it's built in densified hubs around uh, transit, like expansions of the SkyTrain, which has been happening, um, and if the plan that the mayors of Metro Vancouver have been talking about for many years, and uh, we've heard the new NDP Green government will implement, uh, is actually put in place, we'll see a whole bunch of light rail through Surrey, uh, better transportation in that whole region, um, really, the question is what happens south of the Fraser. So uh, the fact that we have an opportunity to make design changes, do things differently in Ontario is fantastic, or sorry, in British Columbia. Uh, as I'm sitting here right now in Toronto, uh, I'm very aware that the most greenhouse gas intensive corridor uh, in Canada, in our whole country, is basically between uh, Toronto and or around Quebec City, uh, Montreal, really. And, um, you know, that's largely because the movement of goods, uh, you know, that's happening by truck uh, and in planes on these very short flights. And, of course, the takeoff is the most carbon intensive part of every flight. So the uh, carbon emissions per uh, flight are much higher for the short flights than they are for the longer ones in terms of the, you know, footprint per kilometer. Um, you know, so the, you know, there's been talk of a light rail uh, or some sort of rail corridor 
to move goods and people more efficiently, um, basically along that highway infrastructure, which, by the way, we will be driving along uh, later this month in our Prius uh, on our way to Montreal and then to PEI and then all the way back from PEI to Vancouver. Um, so, you know, we'll bring you to a bunch of those places uh, firsthand and talk about where the energy comes from and what that rail corridor could look like. Um, but these are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about is, is how do we design uh, for sustainability? And it's not just a matter of spending money. It's actually a matter of, uh, you know, of, of the right kind of policies, the right kind of framework that actually supports this kind of innovation. Uh, Patrick's book does a great job of, uh, of taking you there. So, um, you know, maybe what we'll do for a, a future interview is I'll actually do an interview with uh, Professor Patrick Condit to talk a bit more about that. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I've got some old footage of, of his that I can share with you. Um, just for the sake of sharing one other thing that I absolutely love, um, a book that had a huge impact on me um, was this book called Biomimicry, uh, Innovation uh, Inspired by Nature, I think is the, uh, uh, the subtext. Um, and that is by uh, uh, Janine Benius, um, who I discovered through the Bioneers lecture series. Uh, big shout out to the Bioneers, high five to Josh and to everybody else from Bioneers. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, the reason I'm showing you this is you know, it's, it's worth thinking about the fact that in Canada, uh, most of our rail infrastructure is basically moving fossil fuels right now. You know, by and large, our rail moves coal, oil, and wheat, uh, but really primarily coal. Um, and as uh, there's been a push to move more oil, uh, it's actually been displacing wheat, which has, uh, you know, created conflict and, and concern from farmers. Um, you know, anybody who tells you that we're in a debate between pipelines and rail right now, by the way, small aside, totally not true. Um, we're actually running out of rail capacity. There is not anywhere close to the same amount of space on our rail uh, corridors to move oil uh, as they want to move in pipelines. Um, so that really is a false dichotomy, a false argument. It's really tr a way to try to scare people uh, into supporting pipelines um, by reminding them of the Lac Majantique uh, disaster, unfortunately, which is a, a really, really awful tactic, if you ask me. Um, but to come back to this uh, to this lovely slide, um, you know, if we look at the rail that we have in Canada and we compare it to rail elsewhere in the world, uh, what you see in the bottom right-hand corner here, can you see my mouse? It's kind of a little bit slow, I think, but my mouse on my screen anyway is pointing at that uh, um, bullet train right there um, in the bottom left-hand corner from Japan. And, uh, you know, they... It, teaches us an interesting story. I mean, as these kind of new pieces of rail infrastructure have been built elsewhere in the world to move people at much higher speeds, you know, in the hundreds of kilometers an hour, um, you know, these, uh, these bullet trains have had some problems that people weren't expecting. And one of them was uh, that when these trains went through a tunnel, uh, they would actually create basically a sonic boom, like, uh, you know, the, the pressure change moving from the inside the tunnel to outside of the tunnel would make a really loud noise. Uh, as somebody who's really sensitive to noise, I can tell you that that would really suck for people living around uh, that area. Um, but it also uh, was a drag, uh, and I mean that in the dad joke uh, uh, bad way of saying that, which is that the, the drag, uh, you know, the, the friction um, would actually slow the train down a bit, would actually reduce its efficiency. And it just happened that this, um, this guy, who is one of the chief engineers for the bullet train, uh, also happened to be a master birder. And uh, he realized, well, he was looking for um, basically examples in nature, design examples, of where something moved from one medium to another uh, with minimum friction. And he looked at the beak of the kingfisher bird and realized that the beak of that bird, um, you know, perhaps had, uh, you know, some design benefits. So they made models where they uh, tested bullet trains at high speed. Uh, that had a similar shape to that beak of a kingfisher bird. And that's actually why the bullet train looks the way that it does, because what they realized was that they could actually reduce the drag by about 30%, uh, which is huge, right? Like any time when you can increase the efficiency of something by a third, uh, it's dramatic in terms of the electricity requirements, but, uh, you know, also just in a whole variety of different ways. It's it's a very positive step in the right direction for the design of this, uh, of this um, train. Um, and the beautiful thing that you'll discover in Janine Benius's book is that there's many, many examples of this where we've learned these amazing things from the natural world. Uh, again, another small aside, um, whenever you're thinking about the protection of a beautiful natural place, I ask you to remember that, uh, that there's a variety of reasons to do that. It's not just because uh, of how beautiful it is or how lovely it is to be able to vacation there or the way that it looks. 
Um, but, you know, also there's, of course, the ecosystem services that we depend on. Like, for example, you ch chop down a lot of forests. We rely on them to sequester carbon, which helps keep the temperature of the planet low, but also it produces oxygen, uh, also helps stop runoff, which can prevent flooding. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's also this other whole set of benefits, which are the species that live inside of these forests that we're uh, trying to protect. Uh, may actually have important technology for us. I mean, whether you look at it as uh, intelligent design or evolution, uh, the reality is is that you're talking about thousands and thousands of years of uh, of technology that is beneficial. Um, and you know, there may be a cancer cure inside of that forest, or there may be a more efficient bullet train, or there may be a uh, more efficient way of uh, uh, you know, uh, creating a, uh, a lubricant or a way to, uh, you know, make uh, uh, more uh, strong materials or, you know, anyway, the, go check out Janine Benius's book. Um, also, she has this uh, amazing website, which I haven't looked at in a little while, but you should check out. It's called asknature.net, I think, or .com. Anyway, Ask Nature. Um, and the neat thing that goes on there is it's basically a multidisciplinary discussion um, where people will pose questions to a whole variety of experts from different fields, whether they be ecologists, biologists, um, you know, bird lovers, uh, people with expertise in specific species, and they basically will say, how does nature do this? And, you know, some design problem that a person is trying to solve. Uh, other people will talk about examples they know uh, in the natural world where um, those questions have been solved or where some creature is, is solving that question and it opens up an opportunity to start studying uh, you know, like, for example, the kingfisher bird, why why that shape is so much more efficient and how it could be used uh, for something like a train. So anyway, um, small aside, but I, uh, I just want to share with you guys some uh, some neat resources that you could use. So that brings us up to the next step in our uh, show. I'm already at 3.33 Eastern Standard Time, so I have been going on for a while. Uh, how you like in the format of the show so far? Is this working for you? I'm really digging doing this. I'm hoping you're liking it. Um, do you need more detail? Do you want less detail? Uh, you know, you let me know. Your feedback is very much appreciated. Um, but, you know, for today's update, I'm actually going to take you off of this page that I'm looking at. And I'll take you over here for a second. Uh, and I'm going to show you this nifty page, which is uh, my page on our new fundraising website. Uh, so we've been in Toronto now for a little bit over a week. We drove from Vancouver to Toronto. Uh, last week I showed you some clips of us running around in Lake Louise, which was very cool. Um, so in the uh, time since we left Vancouver, we stopped a couple of times for little runs uh, in our drive to Toronto, but honestly I was uh, kind of rushing to get here to try to get here to spend time with family before my 40th birthday. and. Uh, a couple of my siblings were only going to be in town for a short period of time. Missing you already, Marissa and Max. Love you guys. Um, but in the time since we left on our trip, we've now run 39.9034 kilometers. Uh, and if you go to this page, uh, we'll post the link to it, but it's ayura.ca. Uh, ayura, by the way, stands for As Yet Unnamed Running App, which was the very clever name that our friend Gideon, who built this for us, uh, came up with. Um, if you haven't seen this yet, basically what we're doing is we're raising money per kilometer with this nifty new tool. And what you can do is right here, you can actually put in your name and then pledge an amount. We suggest at least a minimum donation of 25 cents a kilometer up to a maximum of whatever you want. Um, I want to say a big thank you, by the way, to all the people who've donated already. Um, we're already up to, uh, let's see, what are we, a little bit over $5 a kilometer for every kilometer we run. So today, uh, let's see, did it show up on here yet? Did I even save my run from this morning on here yet? Do, 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 do. Oh, yeah, it's, I haven't actually put the picture in the description in, but we raised $50.25 by running 5.5 kilometers this morning. Um, so that's very exciting. Uh, our goal is to help fully fund the tsleil Nation Solar Project. Um, for anybody who knows me, you know that I, uh, I have been working very closely with the tsleil Nation for many years now, uh, and actually now working for tsleil Nation as my day job, uh, helping to support their um, uh, Sacred Trust initiative, which is the campaign to stop the proposed Kinder Morgan pipeline uh, and to push what they call it their Yes Agenda, uh, which is basically a campaign to bring about uh, you know greater support and a faster transition to renewable energy, as well as more work to restore uh, and support the thriving Burrard Inlet ecosystem. 
Um, one small aside about the Yes Agenda, a very cool thing happened this year for anybody who doesn't know. Uh, for the first year since 19, what year was it, 72, I believe, uh, the Slavitut Nation was able to successfully harvest clams uh, from a location that they're not uh, sharing publicly because they're trying to make sure that the uh, ecosystem remains as intact. Um, but they've been doing work to uh, restore the local ecosystem in up Indian Arm in particular, and uh, they've been reintroducing species, doing all kinds of habitat restoration work, and it's actually gotten to the point where they were able to successfully harvest clams, and I was uh, I had the rare, real pr privilege of attending a feast where we actually ate clams that were harvested from Burrard Inlet. So if you think of Burrard Inlet as a sacrifice zone, it definitely is not that. It's an area that's been impacted over the years, uh, but it's definitely an area that's still teeming with life uh, and, and definitely needs to be protected. Um, this brings us back to that point around, like, you know, at what point are we able to make the transition? The reality is uh, that we actually are at a place right now where we could be scaling down our dependence on fossil fuels. And new pipelines actually take us in the wrong direction. It takes us towards more and more dependence on fossil fuels, not less. So um, I ask you to consider that. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the ways that we're trying to help communicate that, uh, which is a great opportunity for a partnership between Slavitoth Nation and the Great Climate Race, uh, you can see the synergy here and the different stuff I'm doing in my life. Um, Slavitoth is building a large solar project, which will be about a 47 thousand kilowatt hour a year project, which I think makes it the second biggest in Metro Vancouver, only to the uh, Tesla building in downtown Vancouver, um, but directly across from the Kinder Morgan terminal. So as this debate is happening about fossil fuels, it's a great way to really illustrate the viability of this technology, to demonstrate it. This is really, I believe, what we need is more and more of these demonstration projects. Uh, and there's a beautiful tie-in to electric vehicles, because as we get more and more of these batteries, on the road, um, those batteries can provide backup storage capacity because as the sun's not shining at light, er, at night, uh, you can capture the energy during the day that's above and beyond what you're using during the day. And then when you really need it at night, you can be drawing it off those batteries that are storing it. So while your car's parked, uh, you know, during the day and then overnight, uh, your car can be playing a variety of different roles. In fact, it could even be earning money for you. Uh, and we're hoping that projects like this one um, not only reduce the amount of energy that's needed by a uh, slave to the nation, but actually could be generating some revenue year after year to go back into the community. Um, so with the combination of this new, um, very energy efficient uh, admin building and health building uh, that slave to this building, uh, there's going to be this solar installation, the large solar installation. Uh, we're very excited to be helping to raise money for it with every kilometer that we're running in all these different locations across Canada. Um, so if you'd like to help support that, um, you can do so on this page. Uh, again, we'll link to it uh, in the notes in various places. Um, or you can just go to A-Y-U-R-A dot C-A, Ayura dot C-A. We're going to come up with a better name uh, a little down the road, but uh, for now it is the as-yet-unnamed running app. Uh, thanks again to Gideon for both that clever name uh, and also for all the work that he's done on this. Um, in particular, I want to point out that uh, if you saw this last week, he just added this little piece here where it actually shows you our run data from Strava. Um, so each time we go for a run, you know, I post a picture. And as you can see, like starting from our first run that I did once we had this site up, um, you know, the funds raised were $1.26 because there'd been uh, very few donations made at that point. Uh, per kilometer. This was uh, on my birthday, the day that we launched it. That was uh, my first run in my 40s. <laughs> um, and as time progressed, that's a picture of my brother Max right there, Missy Max. Uh, that's Rosie, our secret weapon, me and Mari going for a run. Uh, as you can see, as the amount of donations per kilometer increased, the amount that we raised per kilometer went up. Uh, also at the bottom of the page, you'll see that we've got a social media stream here. Uh, which is basically updating from all of our different social media channels as we're posting content um, from our tour. So um, one of the ways that you can come and get updates is just by coming directly to this page. We're also going to get our blog updating on this page. So as we post blog updates, they'll be there. Um, but it'll be even more uh, for you who's, uh, for you folks who sign up um, to our uh, uh, to our um, email list, the, uh, which is, again, at greatclimaterace.org slash tour dash updates. Um, and that page, um, or that email list is also how you will have an opportunity to be one of the first beta testers of this app as we get closer to rolling out, uh, the full version of it, uh, in its, uh, you know, 
beta form for all the people who participate in our international virtual race the last weekend of October. Uh, that's right, little sneak peek. We're doing our next international virtual race uh, in Vancouver and elsewhere around the world uh, in the last weekend of October, and we're hoping to be using this app to do that uh, in some version of it, and hopefully the an extremely exciting version of it, and there's more features uh, that I'm hoping we'll be able to tell you more about soon. Um, but I think the best thing I could do, and a great way to get there, actually, is I'll just click on it right off of here. The next thing we're going to do is share with you an interview with this awesome guy. Uh, Mark Tigia from Novo Solar. I'll just rewind that a tiny bit before we go live on that interview. Um, I don't know if you're out there watching Mark or if anybody who knows Mark is watching, uh, but I just want to say a big thank you uh, to Mark and Novo Solar for being um, a sponsor of the Great Climate Race. They set up a display booth in past years. Uh, I've uh, had the chance to go up on their roof and check out the installation that they did on their own roof. Um, this is a great little video to share. It was actually shot um, about a year ago, last summer. Yeah, last summer. Um, and what we're doing is we're actually standing in front of the solar uh, installation that uh, is already up at Slavita. This is a smaller installation that they had done that provides all the power for their um, uh, elementary school in the community, which is very, very cool. Uh, as you can see, it pivots to, to find the sun. Uh, and what I've been told is it's actually outperforming expectations and actually paying itself back faster than expected originally. Um, but it was, uh, we were actually there shooting a video for uh, Slay with Tooth Nation uh, with, uh, with moms. It was the mom says video for anybody who uh, hasn't seen it. You could post that in the show notes too. Um, but this video um, was a little extra little clip that we did with Mark and his mother uh, who came out to be part of that video shoot that day. Uh, and joined us uh, at this location. So anyway, I'm going to go full screen, share this interview with you, and then we're pretty close to wrapping up for the day. Uh, and maybe I'll turn this screen around for you guys watching on Instagram so you can see it too. He has a perfect climate for it. It's not too hot. We get enough sun. Um, in, in Europe, um, the solar panels are extremely popular and uh, they're producing um, only about 50% of the electricity they need over there with less sun hours than we get. And uh, it's great for the environment. Um, we can create jobs. Um, as the industry grows, um, it'll be great for the local economy, um, not just the local one, but all across Canada. Well, uh, we uh, couldn't be any happier to find people like you out there in the world. Uh, you know, as the Great Climate Race, we're obviously trying to get people to think differently about what's possible and, you know, being able to see projects like the ones you guys are building, uh, you know, I think makes a really big difference. Well, I, I want to tell you, as a sponsor, I, it, I, I didn't just, I didn't have to think about it. Um, what you're doing is a really great thing. And, um, you know, a lot of people say that solar is too expensive. Um, it's it's become a lot less expensive. But for charities and things like that, um, non-profit organizations that don't have the, the funds, it's great that um, people like you are around to, to raise money for them. And, uh, and, and hopefully we can work together to solve their energy problems. Uh, well, thanks so much, Mark. And, uh, and you brought your mom here, too. Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, can you tell me a little bit about your son? Well, he's going great guns, and I'm really proud of that because, you know, not too many people are aware of uh, the valuable uh, things that you can do with solar. And, uh, you know, it, it's growing, and it's, it needs to be more uh, open to to local people too that the, because industry is powerful mm -hmm. you know and I think if we replace uh, with solar then it's, it's healthy for everything for us and for for the environment so there you go all right sorry I know I took you guys off the screen for a second there like I said, every week I'll get better at this. <laughs> hey, look at all that. I can see all this conversation you guys are having there now. I, it was harder to see when I was on that other screen. Um, okay, so that brings us to the end of The Great Climate Race Live, episode number two. Uh, again, today is Friday, July 7th, 2017. Um, thank you so much for joining us again today. Uh, the question I want to leave you with today is... Uh, let's see. Hmm. I had a couple different ones. Um, hmm. I'll leave you with this one. Have you heard about this book, Drawdown? 
uh, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming, edited by Paul Hawken. Um, you know, we've been talking about doing some sort of a book club or a weekly discussion. I'm curious if, A, you've ever heard of this book, B, have you read it, and C, would you like to be part of some sort of a book club or discussion group? It could be online or in person. I'm thinking probably online because we do a lot of virtual stuff. Um, I think Mari and I are both going to try to read more of it before next week uh, so that we can talk about it some more with you on the on the show next week. Um, but I just wanted to give you a heads up about this. So uh, this week we showed you a bunch of different cool books. Um, the uh, first one was, well, there was a report from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, there was also, um, you know, various news stories we shared with you about uh, what's going on with Tesla, with various, excuse me, with Volvo and Volkswagen. Um, and uh, finally, we showed you um, uh, the book uh, Seven Rules for Sustainable uh, for a Sustainable World, Design Strategies for, oh, I messed it up. Uh, <laughs> that book, you'll have to go back and, and look at it. Oh, it's bothering me. I'm going to go find it. What's it called? It's called... You're going to have to forgive me. But I couldn't help myself. I needed to know. I've talked about this book so many times, but I, uh, you know, Seven Rules for Sustainable Communities, Design Strategies for the Post-Carbon World by Professor Patrick Condon. There you go. Uh, and the other book that we're sharing with you is uh, Drawdown, uh, The Most Comprehensive Plan Ever Proposed to Reverse Global Warming, edited by Paul Hawken. I don't know if you know Paul Hawken, but he's awesome. Just to give you a little uh, look at this, he doesn't just talk about renewable energy. He talks about things like uh, how we have to focus on uh, educating uh, women. I just turned to this page, probably because Mari was reading it and it opened to, uh, right to here. Um, but, you know, he looks at a whole suite of policies that need to be explored uh, to really impact climate change global warming. So, anyway, with that, um, I will leave you with that question. Let me know what you think. Uh, and again, any of your feedback on, uh, on the show. How is it going? What you'd like to see us do differently? Is there anything you'd like us to focus on? Please let us know. Um, but the question for this week is, have you heard of that book? Have you read that book? Do you want to be part of a book club? Sound good? Okay, cool. Uh, with that, I'm going to put this cool video up on the screen again.